Fox 5 Health News and IVF technology may just give false hope to most women over 40. At least that is what a new book is asserting, finding that the success rate in older women has been highly exaggerated. Right. Joining, yeah. uh, oh. Joining us now is Fox 5 medical contributor Dr. Debbie Nampia Parample. And I do think this makes sense every time we hear of a successful older person doing it, we do the story. So you're sort of maybe getting a false idea of it being easier than it well, is. This is going to disappoint a lot of women. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, to be fair, I mean, IVF is miraculous for a lot of women, but it's like you said, I mean, there is a bias sort of in reporting the successes and kind of being quiet about mm -hmm. things that might not work out. I mean, so just to kind of get back to the basics, I mean, in fertilization, right, you have to have the egg and the sperm meet each other. Now, when you're younger, you have a lot more eggs and they're generally genetically pretty normal, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so the chance of getting pregnant per year is close to about 95% when you're much younger. Um, as you get closer to sort of 25 to 30, then that rate comes down a little bit more, still to 80% or so within mm -hmm. a year. Um, and when you get to 35, well, even for a given month, that number starts to drop a little bit more. So it's maybe 15 to 20% chance of getting pregnant per month. Mm -hmm. But that's not really, that's actually still a positive number. Now, for, for most people, um, once you get to 35 or afterwards, the eggs, the number of eggs goes down, but also they become more genetically abnormal. So the chance of getting pregnant or having a healthy pregnancy comes down. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, IVF can be more helpful. Um, but the problem is a lot of women who could have children earlier on might delay pregnancy, which is what it sounds like happened to this author, mm -hmm. uh, because they thought IVF would be a fail-safe, right? Right. And it's not necessarily effective for that purpose. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it just sort of mechanically, mm -hmm. um, what IVF does is it takes the egg and it takes the sperm and it physically puts them close together, whether it's in a petri dish or if you inject the sperm into the egg. So you have a better chance of getting pregnant that way. It bypasses some of the things that can cause problems. I mean, the sperm doesn't have to swim to the egg, right? Right? Uh, if the woman has a problem with endometriosis and the egg can't get down the tube or get to the uterus, this also avoids that problem. And but they can also do some screening too as well. Exactly, of, the, of course. Right. I mean, they can do different things. They can do, um, even for once they potentially create an embryo, right, they can do I mean. some genetic biopsies mm -hmm. to see how things are going. They can also look at how the uterus looks in terms of putting the egg back. Um, but basically the idea is that the success rate is not 100%. You mm -hmm. know, even for natural pregnancy, it's somewhere between 15 and 20% per month for a woman who's 35. With IVF, it's still about that rate, it's still in the 20% range, it's not 100%. So. <laughs> well, because we forget that women are really meant to have babies so much earlier, like the you know right, early twenties. Right, yeah. Exactly. But nobody's so, doing that these days. Well, thank you. That's we wish everyone the best sure. in that situation. Okay, let's talk about this. Another big one: treating your pain without drugs. A re report that was released by the federal government looks at alternative treatments. Uh, that are getting some promising results. Well, I think it's interesting that we call them alternative, right? Yes, because because I think, they were original. <laughs> yeah. Because I think these things, I mean, we're talking about exercise, yoga, meditation, stress relief, acupuncture. These things are actually becoming more common practice, and they have a lot of evidence behind them. Mm -hmm. So why do we still kind of think of them as alternative or sort of complementary, right? Um, now, this particular study, they were looking at back pain, so I sort of differentiate that into two categories. You know, you could have your flare-up of back pain, which might last for a couple of days, right, where you might suddenly have an episode of back pain, you kind of incapacitated for a couple of days, and then you start to maybe feel better. Mm -hmm. And then you have more chronic pain where maybe you have back pain all the time, or maybe you just have these frequent episodes of back pain, mm -hmm. right? So for this type of research, they were looking more at the chronic low back pain. So not, not that a person should go out and exercise the day that they have an episode or flare-up of back pain, but in general, how can you try to prevent some of these things from happening? So the idea here, uh, there's a lot of research that shows, like if you think about when you learn to ride a bike, right? You know how when you start, you go from point A to point B and it's not that efficient, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of get there, but you made a lot of mistakes, yeah. you fell along the way. Um, but as you practice more, you get more efficient at it, right? And get better at it. So the idea here is maybe with your first episode of back pain, your body and your brain wasn't that efficient in terms of getting that message of pain mm -hmm. back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. But as you have more episodes, it gets much more efficient at sending that pain 
pain message. So it's a lot easier to have more of these episodes. Like a little thing can trigger oh, wow. the pain I never as thought opposed of it that to in the beginning. That makes sense, right? Yeah, so that's over the past probably 10 years that that research has come out. Now, the idea behind exercise is that maybe your endorphins, your natural endorphins, can interfere with that process. You know, yoga too, that maybe there are things you can do, not just to strengthen your core, maybe take some pressure off your back, but also to interfere with that process. Right, mentally, just to make sure. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You and hear that, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> and since Our director has <laughs> yoga. And since stress tends to make every type of pain worse, if you can do things to relieve the stress, it's not that stress directly causes pain, but anything else kind of unmasks it, makes it, it worse. right? Gotcha. So oh, you can control miserable. those things. Dr. Debbie, no, 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 that miserable. is it, yeah. And you know who can relate to that along with Pete? You, right? Nick? Lower back pain. Yes. Mm. It comes can be when I have stress, no joke, stressful right? period. Oh my yes, gosh, forget no it. Joke. It's awful. Yes. You know, you sure. get one of these attacks that last three or four days. And if you think about it, that's when you get a like a muscle spasm and it hurts even more. Oh, so yeah. you have to like just clear your mind. <laughs> exactly. One thing leads to another. Exactly, exactly. And there's a there's a lot of junk in my mind, so sometimes <laughs> it's hard to clear. Well. All right.